All right, so this will be the last uh, of the food lectures. And what we're also going to do is kind of kind of finish up what we started on the last dialogue about all the um, <clears throat> all the issues that uh, happens to the environment with food production. So that's really what what this section is supposed to be talking about. And so one of the main concerns is topsoil. There are some people that argue that topsoil erosion is one of the more serious ones. Uh, topsoil is really that part of the ground that is functional uh, for growing crops. Um, and luckily in the United States, what, one of the reasons we're considered one of the food baskets of the world is we have a fairly thick um, topsoil and grasslands and uh, shrub communities usually do have quite a bit of um, topsoil, which, which makes them prime candidates for food. Um, growth. Uh, whereas things like tropical rainforests, uh, although there's huge amounts of diversity there, uh, most of that is locked up into the living things that are above ground. And so what you find in a tropical rainforest is their topsoil is very, very, very thin. Um, and that's why in the tropical rainforest, uh, they do a slash and burn agriculture where they cut down the forest, sell the wood, uh, then burn everything to get those nutrients back into the soil dig it up, start putting crops on it. Uh, unfortunately, that to topsoil will only survive for about five years. Um, and then they got to move on and cut more forest. And the other thing they have is uh, with all the rain, they have major erosion, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And so um, lots of those nutrients are swept away. So um, all kinds of problems. Um, so topsoil renewal is one of the Earth's most important ecosystem services. Uh, it's a slower process, though. It takes a long time. Um, and the way we're doing crops is we are, we are definitely taking out more nutrients than we are putting in. And that is, that is a definite issue, uh, which is leading to some problems. One is desertification. Uh, and the process when the productive potential of topsoil falls by 10% or more. Um, This is just from overusing land. It's as easy as that. And desertification definitely is increasing. Um, and we have very severe areas. We have uh, the Sahara Desert is, is expanding. Um, and you can see the numbers, moderate, severe, and very severe. So this is a, um, a huge threat because uh, as this continues, it's going to leave less and less land available for, for growth. Um, and then this almost looks the same, uh, uh, this picture, but if you look, we have a different color to it. Um, one of the problems is excessive ir irrigation uh, puddles, the water puddles, and then it evaporates. And when it evaporates, it leaves salts. And so here on the right-hand side, this picture, what you're seeing is that salt residue. 20% of the world's irrigated cropland produces about 40% of the world's food. But one of the problems is we're getting salt. If you don't believe me, drive up the five freeway. And if you ever kind of pay attention to the ditches off the sides of some of the crops you uh, drive by, you'll see this white caked on film. And that's what it is. It's actually this uh, uh, salt. Livestock production generates 18% of all greenhouse gases. So to bring in them, and then obviously our fertilizers um, are all kinds of uh, issues for um, increasing uh, uh, global temperatures. All right, so biodiversity loss during production. Um, so here we can see uh, they're clearing. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have tropical rainforest. And on the left-hand side, it's, it's been cleared. This is the Amazon Basin. This is where uh, some of the highest biodiversity on the planet exists or did exist on the left-hand side. And it is being wiped out for crops. And then this picture, I believe, is sugarcane. Um, uh, but anyway, um, yeah, the biodiversity is just gone. Uh, you know, uh, there are some some of the animals in the in the forest that may venture slightly out into the into the fields there, but uh, just not good. All right, we can protect the crops, and we don't have to do it um, in such a way that we destroy everything. Uh, what we need to do is learn to be better. Um, I'm not saying get rid of all pesticides, but be selective. Uh, there are biological pests that control, and this is one of the famous ones. Uh, the little insects you see there are aphids. 
And then up on the right hand side, what you're seeing is a ladybird beetle. We'll call it a ladybug. It's not a bug, it is a beetle. Um, but uh, uh, you can use these. I've done this in my house. You can actually buy these at Home Depot or Lowe's at times and, and uh, uh, just release them. Um, and they naturally control pests. Uh, they, they will target very specific pests. Uh, so when you spray with a chemical, you might be taking out everything good and bad in, insects, whereas these are very um, direct. Uh, but the problem with that can be is um, it's slow. It's slower. Uh, we, we basically have um, broken the cycle um, and when we go in and we dig and we plant. And so insects can find their way in. And unfortunately, we have broken the cycle on the, on the predators maybe for those insects. And so we end up using um, synthetic chemicals. Um, and here are the trade-offs. And again, I, I will let you look at that on your own. I'm not too concerned. Uh, protective laws and treaties, what have we done? Um, we have a 50-fold increase in, the, in synthetic pesticides since 1950. If you look up on the right that picture, you probably have some of those. Uh, some of these are probably worse than others. Um, the fact that you're storing them all together, <laughs> synergism, that may not be a good idea. Uh, but anyway, um, pesticide use is regulated by several different groups, the EPA, the USDA, FDA, and FIFRA, which is probably the one that, that really is, is control, controlling a lot of it. Um, but unfortunately, there's not been a lot of funding for them to, to really manage it well. Um, and there is a boomerang effect. I do want you to know that term, the boomerang effect. And what that means is that uh, there are certain chemicals that we can't use in this country because of their health issues on people. Uh, but we are the number one manufacturers of like DDT. Um, and so what happens is we can't use it here, but we other places use it. So we, we, we manufacture it, we send it there, they spray it on their crops, and then their crops come back to us. Uh, so, oh, what a world we live in. Um, and just to make sure you understand, uh, you know, DDT is a nasty chemical. We talked about it once before, I think. Um, but it was this miracle chemical, Rachel Carson, that was the... Uh, pesticide she, she had mentioned. Um, well, it's produced in a faraway place you've never heard of before called California. Um, and uh, they had the uh, crops and, and, and stuff used and all the residues and the DDT that was not legally to have anymore. Um, we, we would ship it out to the ocean, get far enough out and just dump the mer uh, metal barrels into the um, ocean with the thought it's so big, who the hell is it gonna hurt? Uh, if you know anything about metal and salt water, it is rotting through. Uh, the ones, uh, what happened was they were going out to do this and cutting corners. They didn't wanna go out as far. So they dumped them closer to shore and the ones that would not sink, uh, they would puncture. <laughs> and so uh, just to let you know, um, but you never go anywhere. And actually right now you probably can't, uh, but there is a lot of barrels of DDT and DDT sludge is what they call it. Um, right offside our coast, right next to Catalina Island. Um, and so they were looking super fun cleanup. How do we clean it up? And the problem is trying to clean it up by picking it up actually causes it to leak more and that may be a bigger hazard than just leaving it. So um, yeah, so you have problems, your children have problems, their children have problems and their children have problems. You're all gonna die. All right, alternatives to synthetic pesticides. There's lots of things we can do. Uh, you know, we have, um, um, Crop rotation, uh, and what you do is instead of just growing one, you have two or three that are uh, three or four that you kind of just kind of go through. And so what happens with the insect cycles, especially, or even fungus, is that they don't survive. You know, uh, the babies hatch looking for corn and all of a sudden, what, what the hell is this? This is wheat, I don't eat wheat. Uh, so there are ways of doing that. Um, uh, polycultures, again, so if the insects do get in, they're only uh, hitting one of the four crops you're growing. Implant genetic resistance, that's, you know, getting into the GMO situation. So uh, it, it could help uh, if we 
continue to go down that road, but we, we need to be cautious. Uh, biological control, that would be using uh, natural pests like uh, the ladybird beetle. And um, there's natural pheromones you can trap and they do this with the uh, Mediterranean fruit fly that we had. Um, and there are other ways to, to bring in maybe even predators to help out. So you put out pheromones trying to bring in uh, predators that will attack those insects. Um, and there are some ways of uh, disrupting their hormones. So there's a lot of chemicals we're looking at that aren't harmful necessarily, uh, but they can disrupt insect um, life cycles. And then we just need to uh, uh, reduce synthetic herbicides uh, altogether. Um, you know, we're, we're still using it to get rid of weeds and, and, and maybe we need to put in a little, little uh, uh, human, human labor for that stuff. And then the big thing is uh, integrated pest management, IPM, uh, is, is really all of the things we just talked about. It's not, it's not just doing one thing. It, it's basically what's, let's do some cultivation, let's do some biological, and then last resort, maybe some chemical tools. And so that is what we should be doing, uh, but it is time consuming, a little more expensive. Uh, but again, for sustainability and health, it is definitely the way to go. And so some of the solutions on what we can do um, are here on the right. Uh, we just got to get, be, get better at it. Uh, um, and what we need to do is start rethinking the way that we um, eat and produce food. Um, and so one of the easiest or, or yeah, I, I guess easiest uh, ways to do this for the, for the world is eat less meat. Um, if you eat beef all the time, have a couple of days of chicken. If you eat uh, uh, a variety of different meats, uh, a couple nights go meatless. Uh, and, and so just eating what we call lower on the food chain uh, is, is going to make a, a huge, huge difference. Uh, go organic over these high um, uh, industrialized crops um, and buy locally. I mean, all of these things do work. So just to give you an idea of what things take, kilograms of gram required for each kilogram of body weight added for each type of animal. So obviously beef cattle, uh, very high up there. Uh, I believe lamb is even higher than that. Uh, and pigs are four, so, so beef is probably the worst for the environment, pork is next, chicken is next, and then fish, depending on the fish. Uh, uh, there are, you know, there are Different fish, the car carnivorous fish, fish that eat other fish, uh, higher numbers, uh, the um, uh, algae eating fish and or uh, detritus eating fish, uh, much, much lower um, on what they, uh, uh, their impact. But, but you can see again, none of this is equal to one to one, which would be as if we're eating, uh, uh, if we had a vegetarian diet. All right, shift to more sustainable food production. So again, eat less meat, no meat or organically certified meat. And there's the carbon footprint for that. You can see, you know, they, they've kind of converted it how far you can drive a car. Uh, choose sustainable produced uh, herbivorous fish. Um, there are, um, and maybe I need to find it, but there is a link uh, to uh, uh, the, um, Aquarium of the Pacific used to have it, Monterey Bay Aquarium, where there's a little uh, card that, that people would give out and it actually tells you what, what fish are, are better uh, for you to buy uh, for the environment. Now, I'll see if I can find that and put it in the module. Uh, eat, eat locally grown food. Uh, again, you're, you're getting rid of all the transportation costs. Uh, so right there, that would be helpful. Uh, compost food waste, that's uh, something in the green book. It's definitely doable. I, I will tell you, it's a little tough to set up and get started. Once, once you can do it, it's not bad, but it does take a little bit of work to get that process in. And cut food waste, stop making so much damn food or uh, eat it as leftovers or find a way to, to use that extra food. Uh, um, you know, we, we have a tendency to, to, to throw away a lot of food in this country uh, and that, that needs to stop. And so that leaves us to uh, another one of uh, Vogel's principles, page 80, number 12. All food is derived directly or indirectly from plants. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, we need, to, we need to grow plants for food. That, that's obvious. Um, but we could uh, do less of it if we were uh, eating lower on the food chain. 
remember half of our, our grains go to us and then the other half go to um, cattle and uh, other other animals and, and so we could we could feed tenfold more people um, just by um, all becoming vegetarians which I know is not going to happen and I'm not asking it to happen but what I am saying is can make a huge difference and we will stop the recording that is our lecture for food <laughs>